We have Zach Kenny from ZK Painting out of Rhode Island on the podcast this week. We're going to talk about paint, a little paint talk. Uh, we're going to talk about his business, um, but also where he started in this business and how he really started focusing on the higher quality market and what he's done to kind of corner himself into that niche. We've just gone to air machines on air, all our job sites and negative air in the space that we're working. So it could smell as bad as you want, but if all of the air is being filtered through charcoal filters and it's negative space, the client never smells it. So Agreed, but, it, but during the curing process, does that mean that it's not going to emit any VOCs? It's, it's like it's like closed cell foam. Yeah, we, we're not there for the 24 hours that the reaction happens, but it's still in the house. Yeah, you so know, we, I mean, some of them, we run it for five days straight afterwards. Um, for I've had a couple of particular clients where we just run it 24-7. The last client was pregnant, and we painted her first floor, and we just, the entire house, the entire project was being filtered, all the air from upstairs down and, and out for six days straight, and she never smelled fumes at all. Um, that, that's awesome. I just, I just warned the clients that when they, I don't do negative air because it's the whole house with a primer, but it's the fact that, Hey, you guys, I pride myself on you not smelling anything and you're going to smell it during this one part of the process just because yeah. I've had people, you don't say it to cause you think it's nothing. Um, or it's part of your process, but if you don't explain it, it's those expectations where, Hey, you're going to walk through. And then it's funny. Then they go, you know what my guy does? My guy uses like, you know, non VO, but VOC just cause it's really what binds it well. Um, but I mean, Nick, to your talk, I, I just know what I know, and I've gone to that fresh start where it's like a more expensive yeah, primer. Same here. And again, right? And it just—it's just what I know because I don't want to have that peel off because there's really no going. I've had—I've honestly had walls where I've had to peel off an entire wall. Yeah, same here. I'm on a literally on a project at like today as we speak. I had a huge headache. I'm doing a job, and we tried to use the Eco Primer. They call it. It's a water-based yeah. alkyl acrylic primer, and we're having huge failure and it's a small, it was a test and, and the manufacturer said, it's fine, go for it. And we did it and I'll never do it again. Like we learned a huge lesson. Um, well, I think it's also, I, I learned on that one that you really have to be aware of what plaster you're using. I found out during that failure that it was like the line that was in the plaster, there was too much of it. And it was almost leaving, like, you'd peel off the primer. Honestly, it happened during, not the primer, but the, one of the coats that we did. And we realized it was happening. And then peel it off, and I'd, I'd be left with, like, I, I don't know how to describe it. Like, it wasn't, like, like powder, but it was, like, a residue that would be on your hand, meaning you weren't able to brush it off. But if you wiped your hand across it, it would be on your hand, the residue. And So we use pH. Wouldn't, like, we test the pH so, before on new plaster. So I'm talking yeah. about, like, a repaint. This was, and we, okay. it wasn't plaster. It was just a, a skim coat of drywall mud and, yep. and we're having adhesion issues. Um, but p new plaster, like we do pH tests to make sure that you don't end up with stuff like that. Um, cause adhesion yeah, is everything. That first coat's not stuck. You can put the best paint in the world on the top of it and it doesn't matter. That's a good foundation. Yeah. The gravity foundation doesn't matter what you put on top. Do we live? What are we doing? Their intro. Oh, can you not hear me? No, we are, we're rolling, man. That was our cold open. I know, but right I, into primer. I was just start. <laughs> <laughs> Jump right into primer. No, I cool. think I. I mean, John, I think that's a. I think it's a perfect opening because, especially for us, everyone's had that issue. You you talk about how you've peeled a full wall. I've peeled a full wall. I've peeled a, a whole house, and it it's the same thing. I was we were always using oil base and. We do work in the city where it's like no oil-based paint allowed. So then we're using like the the smell-free oil-based because we're, you know, we're not gonna have adhesion issues on, on the on the front of the building saying that you can't use oil because of the smell. And now I'm being told, you know, Big Dog is using latex primer because now that's what they're they're telling them at the paint shop. But as far I, as going, just as far as going over plaster or primer in general, plaster. Because of the like John said, it's the yeah. the lime content. But I we've never done pH tests, so that would be something. I mean, I that's it. Like, cause we end up with like all, all 
frequently. Plaster goes on. And if you, you read used to be a pool guy. What's that? You used to be a pool guy. <laughs> Testing the pH levels of the water. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's I got to it because the back of the can will say uh, new plaster needs to dry for 28 days. And I would be like, well, what does 28 days mean? 28 days of humid, humid conditions at certain, like 28 days is just like a paint company going, well, we're sure by 28 days you're safe. Yeah, so, so I was like, like well, what are we actually tracking? And you're actually tracking. Days April when it's raining every day? Yeah. You could just double that. Exactly. So I was like, well, what are the actual parameters that we're looking for here? Well, it's moisture content and pH. And when those yep. get into a safe range... Now, and so I've had jobs where you're, it, it can vary so much. An outside wall can be different than an interior wall, but at least we have a, an actual metric. Like I'm, I'm very into this to like, why are we doing what we're doing? Not just the subjective stuff that the paint stores will tell you. Not, not the boilerplate thing. And that's what, honestly, I think everyone needs to learn that. We talked about this with the hardwood floor guys is that you used to make your, your hardwood floor and your, your trim acclimate for seven days. What does seven days mean? Right. It may come off the truck matching up with your, yeah. your moisture content, or it may not. And it may take even longer or some boards don't even meet it 20 days in. It's just, you can't go with rule of thumb anymore because someone else said so. It's like trusting someone else's measurement. All right. So we're talking, kind of I mean, we're specifically talking about plaster right now, but down like where Tyler works, you're all, you know, drywall and mud is yeah. what's the parameter there. I mean, we, we are, but a lot of the older homes that I work on, like if I'm remodeling and we're not tearing stuff down, it's not veneer co plaster, but it's existing plaster. And Yeah, but you're I mean, not waiting for it to cure. So what is the parameter for like drywall? Like when, when are you, like, how are you determining when you can prime it? Um, I don't think, like, I've never used an actual parameter because I don't think that we have the issues associated with drywall mud. You know, like we can use a high quality latex primer and it's not an adhesion issue. As long as you get like that extra drywall dust off of what you're painting to some degree, like I'll wipe down the walls or vacuum the walls, whatever I need to. And as long as that's out of there, you're priming over either drywall mud and like, so what I do is uh, setting type compound a lot of times if I'm doing first coat, second coat, and then I'll use bucket mud for the rest of that, which is a lot softer. Um, so anytime that you're priming over that soft compound, it's like you kind of get it on and then it almost like burns into it. Like if you were to put it on, even if you're brushing your corners and you brush them and you work it too much, it starts going into the drywall mud. Like I feel like yours doesn't, it's almost just topical on top of the plaster. The drywall mud ends up sucking the moisture out and I feel like it kind of becomes one. Am I the I only one that's hurt? Know the science behind that, but I know if you don't move fast enough and it's like a skim coated wall, you'll start pulling the drywall mud. I mean, I've, I feel like I've heard that you don't wipe the dust off the wall. <laughs> I've heard guys, it's, I, I swear to God, I've heard guys say that you sand the wall. How is that possible? Then you'll be sanding that thing for like a week because your roll is going to just absorb all the I mean, dust. I mean, not, not to a point where it's, I mean, they're not blowing them off. They're saying they're sanding them and giving them a quick, a quick wipe. Can we ask the painter what's going well, on? I mean, I've, we clean all our walls. I, I can't. I've never heard that. Um, I, to be honest, I think that's probably a painter who just wants less work to do. <laughs> like, like a lot of. I mean, you could say a lot of stuff to people that's just best for you, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't do dry. We don't do drywall, so we've never run into it. Um, I mean, also, is is plaster plaster curing chemically, right? Yeah. So majority of spackle that people are putting on for a finished coat is not setting type compound. So it's just drying by air. So that's why even in bathrooms, it's like if you put that on and you don't put a high quality primer, it's, it's not, you know, setting type compound, you could stick in a bucket and it's still going to cure. Plaster, you could stick in a bucket and it's still going to cure. The spackle is going to loosen up again if you don't. So I feel like, I mean, even if there's spackle dust on your walls, I don't like, I would clean the wall. You don't need to like mop the walls down, but I, I don't realistically, if there were some dust on the walls, I think that you're still going to get pretty good bite as long as you use a good primer. That, and, that and most importantly, dust like almost just softens up again. The, to me, the most important thing is, is back rolling, like mechanically working that paint into the surface. Um, that's like, 
that's something I was taught. Like you, you can experience the difference and, and I've seen it happen where, you know, I, I just happened to me. We were experimenting with a new process on a small wall and we just thought, okay, we're going to spray over the top. Our top of the line primer is going to get sprayed over a clean wall. Well, now we're having adhesion issues and you know, I, my standard way is oil undercoat. Like oil primer is what I go to anytime I possibly can. And on this one up, this one example, the, the manufacturer's like, no, you're good over here. Okay. Awesome. And now we're having issues. Um, but I think a lot of times people like, if you want to save money, if you know, grind me on price, like, okay, I'll just not back roll my ceiling paint or my primer. So Zach, just explain the process of what back rolling is like just step by step. Not like, I just want to know. Yeah. So like is. we'll, we'll have somebody that sprays ahead of somebody with an 18 inch roller. That's just mechanically working the paint after it's been sprayed on. Um, and because for a lot of reasons, like it, it's going to, it's going to work it in there. Um, and then like the next coat after that, it, even like we're, we're just experiencing this, this little, this failure, paint failure that I'm dealing with. And when we spray our top coat, when you, when paint dries, it shrinks a little bit. So we, we sprayed our top coat and as it dries, it's shrinking and it's pulling the paint off of the wall in little bubbles. When we roll that same coat, we don't have the issues because we're mechanically working it on there and there's not that surface tension. Um, so so you, you're applying the paint with a sprayer and then the roller is just basically working it in. So you're not dabbing that roller into a tray no. at the same time during this process. No, correct? we are. Yeah, exactly. It also helps. Yeah. We do the same thing, um, obviously primer and walls, but then it helps if you have to go touch something yes. up and it's only sprayed, like it's going to be super obvious, you know, even like I just went through on this job and we have minor ceiling touch up and I'm not going to reroll the whole ceiling, like the lighting in here, it's good. But I'm like, Steve, what roller did we use to roll this? <laughs> because yep. it was how long ago. And I legit pulled up pictures to because I used two different rollers. And I know that if I use a different roller cover to touch up what we used initially, like you're going to see that difference in there. And like you have at least a chance to get away with touch up if you do back roll. Yeah, we, we have had clients, we spray ceilings on occasion. Um, I've had clients do it. It's always a conversation. Like we spray walls and, and the same thing happens. Like there's a, it costs a lot more money because you're talking about the touch. There's no, just going and touching it up. And it, there's something to be said for a sprayed look on walls or ceilings, but you have to understand that the touch up is not going to be something that just can happen easily. So we need to take more precaution and make sure that when we're done, we're done and there's nobody else there. Um, the best finished the date. Sorry, I do that. I think you're done with the thought. I jump in. No this is the last podcast. Hated it. But I feel like that's <laughs> didn't that all change when Satin and Pervo was basically pulled from the, the product line? Because you used to be able to paint trim and it looked like it was sprayed. I, I and can, now I won't try to get that. back to that. I can with still that? do that with oil enamel for the paint that we okay. use. Um but I'll tell you and, and I can almost get there with our the latex wall paint that we use, Euro Lux, Matt. But when you spray it, like I, t I can, t we're we're do trying to do more of this. We we spray walls in a matte finish from Fine Paints of Europe. It's a really high quality paint. It feels like porcelain when it's done. That finish when it's done is, I mean, it's unbelievable to see and experience. But you're talking about it's a very different process, um, and it's not. We talked about it because we, you know, and immediate question is how much does it cost and it's yeah a gallon of paint is three to four times as much as you know say a ben moore but it's but not what's, even... what's the coverage at the same time like you talk about one can being more money i remember i went to duration but it's not really even but, it, but that's not even it, it only it only covers only so much you end up paying more per can and having to buy more cans so it's compound but even bit. that like even the cost and the, and the coverage it's not even that's not where the cost is coming from it's the prep and the actual application that's where the, that's where you know using a the, the fine paints of europe is really you know escalating the budget in that case it, it has so like we always say there's more horsepower in that gallon of paint so it almost it 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 
it makes it worth it to have better prep. Some paint, like so that, good. Uh, there's just there's good. a lot of paint. Um, until I found fine paints, like you can go to a certain level of prep, and it's great. Once I found fine paints, like this paint is so amazing that it benefit, like it warrants spending a little more time prepping at the higher end for this this like next level finish. I think, I mean, and I jokingly told him he couldn't be a fine paint salesman on this podcast before we started, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, we, we looked at samples here in the shop and it's just the, the fact you're right. It feels like porcelain. It flattens out on the, on a wall, on a sheetrock surface. You don't get those, those roller marks. And I think that, I mean, you, you can talk scientifically to it about the, the fillers that other manufacturers use not that it's good or bad but it's just it's a very very different product but it's also a very very different application process but at the same time like you're doing that prep because you're paying x amount more you know if it's three times per gallon but look at like if you were to do the amount of prep that you did for fine paints and still use the high quality product, like I feel like the cost difference in that job wouldn't be that much. It's like not. the same amount of prep and then use like, like you told me C2 paint versus fine paints. Like the cost difference isn't that much. Like you said, Nick, it's how much work goes into it up front. And that like so many people don't understand that like paint almost obviously there's a difference between what he's using and other lines of paint, but so much more of it is people are relying on finishes for more than they're intended to do. Like they're supposed to put color on walls, on cabinets. And especially when you're spraying like cabinet grade stuff where it doesn't build, where everything has to be flawless beforehand. So at that point, like you're already investing how much in the paint job, why not use a higher end finish that's going to hold up, that's going to, you know, produce better results. It's almost at that point, like it's a no brainer. That's what we experienced. And that's something I've, I've been thinking a lot about recently is like, I started down this path and it was like, okay, I found this paint. I'm doing this certain process. Well, this paint made it so like doing even a, a, a more thorough process made sense, but it doesn't mean that we like, and I, I'm trying to sell this more to clients. Like we can, our strong B is an A plus from most guys. I'm so I'm still out there selling these A pluses where I can use the, the paint. I can do the same prep we used to do and have an amazing product. It's just, I also know because I'm a paint nerd that there's this next level of thing out there. And it's, so that's where I, I've been, I wrestle with sort of where we're going with this, with my company is like, I know that my A plus is it is like a Ferrari to a Mercedes. And, but that doesn't mean that I can't also do a Mercedes with this fine paints of Europe. That's what I used to do was Mercedes paint jobs with, you know, uh, a top of the line Sherwin Williams or Benjamin Moore product. Um, because but, you're right. You guys feel like there's, there's a lot of guys out there that only know what they see in the box store and then see Sherwin Williams and, and that stuff. And that's really all they know is the market. Like this, this fine paints of Europe, I mean, I didn't know about it until I went on your, jumped on your page today. Um, but like, what what is like? It's like mo looking at like youth sports. I'm gonna do the sports analogy. Youth <coughs> sports. Then there's like college sports, and then there's the pros. I feel like a lot of people only get to like high school and, and college level of, of finishes, and negative air isn't really talked about or even spraying. Like, like you're spraying cabinets spraying that stuff on site it's all done in a shop and then deliver because i think people just can't the technicians aren't there to, to really be able to control that environment to have a good finish that you could put in the shop so can you educate us on what else is beyond the jv and get us into the varsity level of paint products yeah i mean so 2k poly is is that other thing so you know there's there's so many types of paint out there and I, to what your, your point earlier, like I had to learn the hard way that what, what the paint store people told me about paint was not the end of the story. And it was, it's very much a subjective, like there's, like, you go to an Sherman Williams or Benjamin Moore store, there is like 10 or 11 different like levels of paint. 
that's insane. Like they they are they shouldn't all be there from an objective standpoint. They're there because of a sales perspective. Right, it's cost driven. Yeah, like it's easier to sell. Everyone walks out of the paint store feeling that they got what they wanted because there's 11 different price points. And 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 but those paints shouldn't exist. There's a ton of paint that goes on trim that's not an enamel, but it's a semi-gloss. And so people think, "Oh, it's a semi-gloss. It goes on trim." And the paint store people sell it to you. Um, so yeah, the, there's a lot of like, I'm really, I want to know at the end of all my prep, am I putting a coating on there? That's going to do what it's supposed to do. Is it going to be hard? Is it going to be washable? Um, is it going to look good? And you know, you can the fine paints is like, it's a, a lot of times it's a luxury product on the interior, on the exterior, it's going to last three times longer than a top of line Sherwin Williams product. So there it's not as much a luxury product. It's a, it's a cost over time. Um, value. Um, but we, I, I spent a lot of time like doing the R and D into the chemistry of what am I putting on here and why not? Oh, the, the Sherman Williams rep told me this goes there. And then when it fails, they don't back it up and they, or maybe they give you a gallon of paint. So I, I, I real I learned early after some, some hard, you know, paint failures that my rep is not into coatings. He's into selling coatings. And once I learned that, I was like, all right, I, I got to go figure this all out myself. And you have companies like Cabot Stain who get bought by Valspar and everything in the gallon is not the stuff, same stuff anymore. They change the serial code by two numbers, same label. And you find out, I found out the hardware, I, I used it on a project and it failed miserably. And then you find out, oh, well, it's not the same stuff that used to be in the gallon. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time, you know, I, I want to know the, the company, what they stand for and what's in the gallon before I put it on. Do you think that a lot of that is personally, I feel, and I think that like, I'm not on the level of painting that you are, but I started painting and finishing my own projects just because of disappointment and like wanting to get better, wanting to try different products or I just was disappointed with the standard that kind of everyone was doing. And I hated painting for a really long time. I couldn't stand it. And the, the problem was that painting as an industry was such a low value trade. Anyone can be a painter. Like, oh, we're gonna paint, we'll paint the job ourselves. And if you're allowing your customers to paint the job yourselves, then there's like, there's no value in that trade. And I hate it because it's like, I get to paint this and I want to do a nice job, but I can only charge X amount. And it wasn't until I realized that there's difference between a paint job and a higher end paint job where it's like, all right, this is what I want to be doing. This is what I want to offer people. And this is what goes into it. And there's really no offense or buts about that. If you want something lower grade, then that's not what you're going to do. But I don't, honestly, I don't think that, 90% of the general public has any idea that there's a difference between what you do and a, a normal painter. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's exactly why I wanted Zach on this is to, to talk about that. Like the fact that the market sees painters as painters and not, not different levels. Like you say, you walk into Sherman Williams and there's 11 different price points or 11 different qualities of paint. I mean, why can't that be the same for the like who's applying it like the paint the, the painter i mean there's no trade that's pitched more towards homeowners being able to do it i feel like it gets paint totally. except for i don't know maybe landscaping like which and, like, and that's what led me to the direction that i'm at and where i'm at today with my company is i was sick of being a commodity and i through like, you know, like many people, like I had a lot of made a lot of mistakes and I didn't like getting squeezed on price. And I was going in and I was doing two coats of primer. I was doing, you know, two nail hole fills. We're filling nail holes. So you can't see nail holes after how many jobs you go into and you see, I can point out every, where every single nail in that piece of trim, I can point it out to you. Why even fill it at that point is I, I often wonder. But those are, those are sort of the differences. So I was doing all of those, doing two coats of primer, standing in between, I was doing double nail hole fills. I was caulking like an artist, all those things. And then I was putting Sherwin Williams or Benjamin Moore paint on. And then I'm going into the sales process and I'm, and I'm trying to explain why my price is 30 or 40% more than the other guy. Hold on. So we, we, we haven't even dug into your past, but where, when are you talking about right now? 
started? Like, did you, did you, when you started your company, were you already doing the level of prep that you're doing today? I would, yeah, pretty close. I worked for guys and I always was, the, every boss said like, hurry up. We're not getting paid to do it that nice. And I was working in high end projects, but I, I was always very like detail oriented. So yeah, when I started, like my, I always wanted to do high quality work. Like I love it. And I was pretty idealistic what, about what, what, it. How'd you know what high quality was? Like, I feel like there's so many people that I know I'm coming across aggressive. I'm in the truck. Um, it, yeah, we haven't even noted that. Think, John, Johnny's on his way to the studio, and he's he's phoning in. No, I, I guess when you started in 01, and that's where I took off your LinkedIn, like, you're an infant to this process in this industry. And so, like, how did you know what who mentored you to understand what the levels were? Or is it like Tyler's saying that people just can – it's just something you can just do and slap up, and you either have the ability to, to cut a nice – a nice line or you don't and you have someone else cut it you roll like explain that whole thing to me i think it a lot of it just came naturally um like my attention to detail and i i like i really like things uniform i like gridded out like i'm i'm not an artist as it relates to like painting thing like i would like gr grab a, a sheet of like gridded out paper and like use a, a ruler and a protractor to do quote unquote art in school as a kid and stuff like I liked uniformity and and symmetry and all those things so when it came to painting and I had this surface that's not perfect I wanted to make it perfect and so I, I don't know like it just sort of I went down that path of like let's sand a little bit more let's try to get a smoother finish when I started to learn to spray like how do we get a better finish and then through forums online back in the day like painttalk.com and I was on there for hours talking to anyone that would listen and watching the few YouTube videos that were around. And I don't know. I just had an obsession to like make a really beautiful product at the end. I think a lot of that's just personality. Like you probably just were, you were never content with the product that you were putting out and you were like, all right, how can I make this better? Totally. Um, and I mean, for personally, I'm, that's very relatable to me. I can remember some of the first built-ins I ever sprayed I didn't know, you know, that there was a difference between domestic birch and uh, Chinese birch. And I sprayed all the boxes and you could see all the grain telegraphing through. And I'm like, so dis like I legit didn't know how to make that disappear. I didn't know about like high build primers. I went and skim coated the inside of the boxes <laughs> and then sanded it back down and then primed it again and sprayed them. And that that was like the only way that I know how to get there. And I knew that it wasn't the right way, but I had to make it look good. And then when I got done that, I was like, all right, so what do I have to do now? And so there's like the material and there's the finish end. But then it's like, all right, start learning about high build primer. It's just such a slow progression, especially with how much the technology has shifted from back in the day. It's like you use an oil-based primer and oil-based paint and they were slow curing and they leveled out and they built well and everything's changed. Even the oil-based technologies change. And if you want to do good work, and you just have that, like you said, obsession to make things better or to challenge yourself, you just have to keep up on top of it. And you have to keep looking to elevate what you're doing and figuring out different processes and de techniques. But it's not just like you get done that job and you walk away and you try it on the next one. Like you walk away unsatisfied and then you spend however many countless hours trying to figure out what's the next product, what's the next technique, what did you do that you could do differently? I mean, that's how... I feel like half the stuff that I do, I learned, and it sounds like it's very similar for you. Yeah. And social media has been huge for me now. Like the forums were like the first, they were the beginning. And now, and the, the Fine Paints of Europe certified group network of people, like I've been able to meet these amazing contractors that are like me around the country. And I can reach out, you know, I had this issue with this job and like I have other like people that are huge paint nerds I can call and like, or like what sprayer are you using? Like, like all that information that if you didn't learn it from your boss, like back in the day, like you, you didn't know, have another avenue. Now you have totally. the avenue. So wait, so <coughs> 2001, you started your company. You were doing the level of close to the level of prep that you're doing now. You're using it, it was 2011, I think. Yeah, you got it. Said, it's it probably said wrong on LinkedIn. Position, position paint, precision, precision. Yes, paint? I started painting back then. Yeah. Oh. So and then you went to David White Weiss, 
Yes. I do got to say, I, when I when I look at your, your LinkedIn, and again, tangent, um, that I, I do judge it where you weren't a guy that was, like, looking to jump up the ladder. It looks like you were there. Like, you were at Precision for, like, five and a half years almost. You know, give or take whatever you put in for LinkedIn for start dates. But that's, like, you weren't a career. You get me? You weren't just, like, feeling out the waters and, like, bouncing around. You were like, let me go at this and let me see what I got here and, and let me learn. Is yeah. That right? Like, you just wanted this and you, nothing was going to stop well, you. Well, that – so that was my father's company, actually, um, Precision Painting. And he started that without – like, he had worked on – he'd done some painting. He, he owned hotels and he restored them and he'd worked with a painter. So that project – like, Precision Painting was, like, high school and then, like, coming back from college kind of stuff where I was like helping him survive and he failed pretty badly. And I learned everything not to do from working with him. But I also learned a lot about, um, you know, we, even then we did, we try to do really high quality work. Um, but then when I, so then I had those skills though, basic skills. And I, I really liked the instant gratification of, of painting. Like I, I do, I love painting. So, then I moved to Philadelphia and I worked for a guy who did very high quality work. Um, and I learned even more from him because he had been trained. Uh, he was like a classically trained painter. So I was able to learn a lot of stuff that I had missed out on uh, with my dad. So, so when you say classically trained, like I think that's what's missing from carpentry where electricians have to get so many hours in, same with plumbers as an apprentice. What Can you explain that whole if you know anything about it like that's i think it goes back to when there was master carpenters nick um you know what gave you that credibility yeah i mean i mean he he had like they had like terms like there was like the apprentice the mechanic the journeyman like and he had worked for a guy who was a master painter who had who had apprenticed i don't know i don't remember a lot about his former boss but he had, he had started as an apprentice and he worked his way up um and so it, it was like those like generations of painters where that knowledge gets passed down. Um, you know, I have a friend here in Boston, Jessica Allred, who's a paint, a master painter. And she was in the union in Las Vegas and like seeing the, like the way you can learn when you're in a union that like, there's just some stuff that is, it's so professional and they take, it's a, it's a, it's a craft. And it, there's a lot of like little stuff that you can see that if you just like grab a paintbrush and some dudes like, Hey, go paint the side of the house real quick. So it changes color. You don't pick up. And if that's your career is you, you go from painter to painter. And the goal is that there's a different color on the surface when you're done, you don't learn a bunch of the ins and outs of like real craftsmanship. Um, and so I, I was exposed to that a little bit there and I really liked it. And I, I mean, I, I talked to Jessica and I see the way she works and I have a lot to learn there with just like the process of start getting into a job and starting it. And like all the little things that you get, if you are in an apprenticeship program. Um, so we, now we're, I have an apprentice and it's the first person I've said, like, you're an apprentice. We're going to like train you and like give you these skills and you know, she loves it. And she's in on the weekends spraying in the booth, you know, on her own time trying to learn, um, Get, getting hours in. Yeah. Making all the mistakes. Cause I mean, that's how I got here is I made a ton of mistakes. So you found painting to be something that you're extremely passionate about. Um, I feel like so much of what makes a lot of these guys successful is having that passion and it's almost like if if your passion would be carpentry i think you'd be a really good carpenter you know if it was cars you'd be a really good auto technician um and i mean i feel like that goes says a lot for what we speak that like there needs to be passion you need to it needs to be more than a job it needs to be more than you said changing the color of something and like when you start questioning that when there's all those tiny little details and nuances, like that's when it becomes interesting. And that's when you can immerse yourself in that and it becomes a career. And it's not like, you're not just a painter anymore. You know, you're not working for a painter. And I think that, you know, like I said before, so much of that is missing from painting more than any other trade. Um, and it's almost, I'd spoke with Lou, you know, Lou, um, yeah 
from around me who's another he uses the same product fine paints um and it's like i remember speaking to him saying how could we help to get the word out to the public for what you guys are doing and i want to i almost want to ask you guys what would you say if you had a room of people and you had to distinguish between what you do and what they think they can do like why should they hire you and Money aside, like what's the big difference between hiring a professional painter and doing it yourself? Uh, I mean, a number of things. I think so. The, I, I think you can divide it into exterior and interior. Um, on an exterior, you're going to get value over time. If, like, I know the standard is for many places and many people is you know, you repaint every three to five years it, before it fails, right? That's always, you never. Don't wait till it fails. That always adds a lot of cost. But on the exterior, it's like, okay, we're going to give you a paint job that lasts over time. So you get a value. Um, we know the products. We know the processes. We know, you know, let's test the moisture content. You're not taking a risk when you hire us. Like that's, we work for, generally work for people who have really nice homes and have a lot of money invested into that home. And if, if I'm a guy who owns a $4 million house, am I going to try to save $10,000 and take a risk on somebody else? So we, like we are, but, we are, but, but the, they don't see that. How do they see that risk? How do they understand that? Because that speaks right to me. And trust me, man, I would love to be able to give everyone the value. I could like Francesco. I have a great painter. Um, I can't use him on my stuff because at a certain point that value has to be seen. And a lot of times, like like Tyler used to just a painter people are like it's just paint to a lot of people yeah. they don't understand like standing in between each coat and getting that crystal finish that's going to hold up when your kids drag their hand down the staircase wall every morning and they never wash their hands when you're able to wipe that off because of a good paint job and not just take the sheen off I, I how do you it's, it's Tyler's question just me saying it it's like how does people <laughs> understand the value in what is there a lot of times it's 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 negative past experience a ton of my clients have had a horror story i i could in the last week i can tell you i've looked at and and i looked at one and i've just found out about another job that we didn't get and you know we were four or five times probably the price of the other guy and i mean it's an absolute horror story now and the client doesn't get what they wanted the room is not even the same sheen that they wanted it's nothing even close so a lot of times it's somebody who tries they take that risk or they don't even know they're taking the risk they just think that i'm just pocketing more money when they see my bid versus somebody else my best clients are clients who've had a negative experience um i'm I'm saying it from my point of view is that like for the spec houses like i can use francisco on my custom projects the renovation stuff like that because I can basically dictate how that finish is going to be, meaning I'm accountable for it. But the problem is with my spec houses, it's like closed cell phone. Okay. No one sees it. You can't sell it. And it's people only feel it when they don't have it. Yep. And it, it, you have to explain that to people that, Hey, you know, this price is a, is a better quality house because there's more comfort. And then when it comes to paint, it's like, yeah, I mean, we made a switch years ago where we went from, you know, not the eco spec or whatever it was, we, we jumped to Aura from Ben Moore for our staircases, our major traffic areas like the kitchen, bathroom. So when people didn't turn their fan, fans on and that residue came down and, and grabbed all that dirt that was on the ceiling and then it created all these drips, we made that switch on our part. But no one in the basically consumer end would pay 20 grand more for our product, our house, because we can tell them it's a better paint job. And, you know, I just I and it's the toughest part about my what I do. But what I've gone to now is like like spec houses aren't going to be for us because yeah. people can't perceive the value. Is the value there? I think it is. But if they can't perceive it then it doesn't really matter anyway. What I'm spo- what I'm like hyper focused on today is the people who do get it or who do want it. I'm looking at them and I'm trying to serve them better than anybody else. And the rest, like we say no to a ton of work. And it was really painful for a long time saying no to tons of work or being in the minds of builders and designers as the expensive guy or the high end guy. But 
I've, I've like sort of weathered that storm to a point where it's just finally starting to be like, I, you know, I just looked at a job yesterday for a designer. We've done no work for because she knows what we're about. But when that project comes up that we're perfect for, I get the phone call. Right. And that, like, that's the value on your end is that you're, you, what? you're, you're already, you're selling it on a consistent <laughs> basis and you're, you're in a very neat, you know, niche market that, you know, there's a whole group of people that want to hire you, but know that the value isn't something that maybe they can't afford it or maybe it doesn't work for their project or, but you're always in the back of their mind. So I feel like you, you jumped, you know, from the beginning stages to the elite as far as products, finishes, all that stuff. And I think what's important um, as far as the trade goes and for your trade, it's those people in between that still are like good house painters and there's still a difference between then and the guy who says he's a handyman and does painting, you know, where like the, the people don't have the budget to do the super high end stuff, but you still got to respect the trade. And like John's saying, he can't, his customers can't justify 20 grand on paint. But if you had A and B and B being a higher end paint job right next to A in the same house, that difference would be palpable. But people don't like people don't understand. And that's just like you had to skip that entire market in order to get paid because people just don't understand that like there's the difference between the bottom and even the middle as yeah. far as product and prep and everything else. And with carpentry, it's obvious you walk in and like things aren't straight, things aren't flat, things are caulked, miters are opened up. With paint, everyone looks at pictures and like that's like personally myself. I'm spending a lot of time doing this and I post close ups of everything because I could take a picture with somebody who rolled the trim with a whiz and it's going to look the same as me prepping and spraying it. It's not until you give somebody that close up shot where it's like, Hey, maybe there is a difference here. Like maybe that was all worth it. And I feel like that for the trade of painting, is so important and that like your back is against the wall and that's going to be a losing battle and it, it's the the ability that homeowners think that they have to paint and that, that that nobody can wrap their head around like no just because you can buy it at home depot and you can go buy a roller and the call the point of entry to this trade is low doesn't mean you should be painting your own projects yeah i think i mean i remember early on that was always the first thing that they would do like you know hey can you exclude pain i'm looking to cut the budget and i out of i don't know the handful of projects that that came up we probably painted four out of five of them yeah and it was and it was always to the point where maybe we got back or maybe they 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 do they i think you're right in the sense of the the cost of entry is low but once they start seeing all the steps and how much work it really is, that value is, you know, easy, more easily perceived. But then to bring it to an A plus level, like you're talking, or like the Ferrari, that the, the perception is so much harder to grasp. And I think, for, at least for me, until I saw and felt the difference and could and, and could physically see, you know, what I was used to paying for and what I could be paying for or what we could be selling as our end product. That's when it makes a difference because I've walked projects and, and I've walked, you know, high end remodels. And, you know, I think, you know, we do a pretty good job with our paint, but there's always, there's always someone doing something better. And I'm always trying to understand what that is. And, you know, I talk to Graham all the time. It's like, if there's something better and it's just a matter of me figuring out how we sell that, I want the option to sell it because if I, if, if you need three weeks instead of two weeks, I, I mean, then I need to figure out how to give you that three weeks. Or if, if, if it's 5,000 in material instead of 2000, like what, you know, how do we, how do we continue to get better? Like, like you do with every other trade, I think paint is, is one that, uh, you know, I don't have a full, uh, a full grasp on. I can tell you it's, but very refreshing to hear a, a builder speak like that i i mean i listen to the podcast and i speak very eloquently well right? yeah you're a brilliant human <laughs> being but, but just like that you care like we don't work for 
really any general contractors in Rhode Island because I've yet to find one who wanted to hear one word about paint. Like they want to know how fast you can get in and out. Like, and that's where, you know, to do what we do, like, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell a client, like, I need a month to do this project. And they're gonna be like, Oh, and like I've learned now, like, no, like I heard last podcast, like I'm not going to say a week to make you happy. Like we are saying it's a month, but we, I hired a consultant to help me like go down this path a little more and like learn about this fine paint stuff and, and a lot of the sales stuff, because really like, I think what we're talking about is it comes down to the sales process. Right. It, and I was out there for a long time making and trying to sell Mercedes and Ferrari paint jobs. And I was doing it from a, a Honda dealership. Right. And the, the thing that he, I really took away from that experience with him was like, I need to go build a Mercedes dealership or a Ferrari dealership because you don't see the Ferrari until it's delivered. You buy it beforehand. So I spend all my time now trying to figure out how I can make the sales process like show the value that we're going to add. So we show up with samples, you know, we we're very professional. Our Instagram, we're trying to show like, here's what it's like to hire us. Mm-hmm. Um, because yeah, it's, it's an uphill battle to show the value ahead of time. Uh, but it, like you said, I bring that sample board and I say, touch your walls right now and then touch these. Yeah. And you know, that I think that's a good analogy of the fact that, I mean, you are where, you know, you're committing to, you know, whatever, $70,000 paint job and oh. you haven't even stepped foot on site. I mean, you've stepped foot, but there's no material on site. There's no example of what it looks like. And obviously that has a lot to do with our industry because we're, we're fabricating something out of, you know, quote unquote, nothing. But when, you know, you're, I, th- I can only imagine how difficult that is. And it's interesting to hear that you don't work for general contractors. So you, you're primarily working for homeowners that already know the value in what you do. Or I get to talk to them. I can't tell you how many designers and architects or d- and builders they won't let me ha- like meet the client in the sales process. So it's like, you know, a, a designer the other day asked me, would you come help sell this project? I was like, that's the n- best thing I've ever heard. Like, yeah, I'd love to meet the client and explain to them what we're selling them and what this is. When a builder just like takes a piece of paper that's an estimate and my estimate goes next to somebody else's estimate and they're just pieces of paper, like we never are going to win that. Right. And, and so that's where like, I've just sort of like, I'm not going to waste my time. A guy sent me a builder in my area, sent me plans the other day. And I'm like, look, I really don't like, we're not going to be cost competitive. So I don't think we're a good fit for this project. There was no specs that said anything that told me that it was otherwise. And he's like, well, it's a four and a half million dollar house. Like, how are you not interested? And I was like, well, you don't care about what we are offering. Like you just want the price that you can put into your three prices and pick the middle or low price. Like, so yeah, finding people who want, like they're going to put a Viking range in this kitchen. Okay. Well, they, they know because they've, they've seen the marketing. They know what a Viking range means. Well, they don't know that this thing exists in painting. I mean, I'm a painter and I didn't know it existed five, seven years ago, at least not the level that I do now. So, you know, most of my, time is spent selling you know it's marketing and selling this thing that i think is a great value to the right customer but like like it's weird but my passion is like there are all these high-end jobs being done where clients do have the money and they do want things really nice and benjamin moore satin and purbo is getting put on and that product is not what it used to be or aura is being put on and that's a great product but there's so much better and so the client out there that does want that really nice thing I just want to be there when, when they're shopping for painters to be like, here, there is this other thing. Let me show you it. But Zach, w- was this product as mainstream as it was when, when we had our last correction and recession? I mean, we're on a massive wave right now. Did, did it open your eyes over this huge bump that we've had of just success in the industry that these guys have pushed out further and, and made a bigger impact in the industry? Like, are you going to be able to keep this model during the next recession where there's less and less want where paint will definitely be lesser on the, the agenda or the priority list. 
I'm, that's my goal. I mean, I, everything I'm doing today is is like I'm is pre- is a preparation for the next recession. Like, there's obviously there's going to be one. You know, we're not going to continue on this trajectory. So I am trying to because, like I said, like, and that's where I've been thinking a lot lately. I got some feedback from some people. And it's like, okay, well, I can still use this paint, but maybe I can do what is a B plus to me, and that's still an A plus plus for what they're used to, and. And, and so I, I'm, I'm looking to try to, because there, there'll still be people who want nice things. Um, well, that four and a half million dollar house, maybe it's the same. It's the reverse of me, meaning I want to get a good painter and, and educate them to get me the best quality. And then they become more valuable for the industry. And is there a way for you to have another, I know you may not want it and it may just seem like a headache, but can you get to a caliber where it is still an A plus? in that level of industry. Yeah. So I thought a lot about that. Um, and that's why I decided to go where I'm going and like, and I've struggled, like I, I, it is, it's so hard to say no to all that other work, but I also, I believed, and I've, it's like a leap of faith that if I, for what I'm trying to do, if I'm trying to sell this thing, like I want to be in people's minds as only doing that. And and then like, yeah, like I have said no to lots of great jobs that I would have loved to do and we would have crushed, but that would have taken two months out of my schedule to go work on a project that wouldn't have led to another project that's, that's in this other thing I'm talking about. So for me, like a lot of, I get a lot of pushback from a lot of people in my life and that are like, well, why are you saying no to all this other stuff? You say you only want to do high end work. And it's like, what? Well, I believe that it's by specializing, I can better serve the market that I'm trying to serve, the high end market. And if I start to tell the guys one day we're going to only do a single coat of primer and a single coat of nail fill today, and then tomorrow we're going to do this, and like for me, like we're trying to train a group of craftsmen to be able to to achieve this very high end product. And if I start to dilute that one day in my experience it's and i don't have i'm not trying to run i know guys who do it they have 100 painters and they have 12 guys that do what i'm talking about and then 80 guys that are doing the other stuff i just i don't my dream is not to have a big company like that i would much rather like really niche down and serve a certain demographic better than anybody else i uh i don't mean to interrupt you i have to roll and it's like a huge bummer to me because First off, I really respect what you're doing. And then second off, what you were just saying is like also right up my alley. Um, these guys probably disagree with me, but anything that we can do as far as like your trade, your craft, what you're doing um, to try and dispel a lot of those myths with the general public, you know, not necessarily on your level, but I think there's a lot of guys who are under you that still want to be good painters and not like super high end. Let us know what we can do. If it's like, you know, getting more people on. Um, I think, I think that a good job make or break a job more than anyone else. Um, just because I've seen it. And I think that that needs to be something that's addressed throughout the industry. I agree. And I, I think this is it, right? You guys are builders talking about paint right now. And that alone separates from all the builders that I know, you know, they just, they're, cause what is a builder? 99% of the time it's a paint, it's a carpenter turned builder. You, you guys love building beautiful trim packages and making really nice carpentry. It's like, then they're just like, well then just paint it. It's like just paint it is the mentality of so many carpenters I know. So, to me, that's what the guy who has to go sell my paint job is a guy generally who just thinks just paint it. So this is, I mean, just this, having this like forum to be able to talk about craftsmanship and, and painting to me is, is already doing so much to help the, the industry. Um, and I love the name modern craftsman. Like what's better than that? Well, I think that's, yeah. I mean, re- I don't know. Much- I feel like I'm already signing you up for round two, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to scoot. All right. All right, Tyler. Appreciate it. Happy holidays. So we're here in the studio with Zach Kenny from ZK Painting out of Rhode Island. And 
Johnny was on the road for the first half. How was that audio? It was horrible. <laughs> Jesus. No, it wasn't bad. I'm sorry. No, we could hear you. I, I was afraid you were going to cut out, but you didn't cut out. I just, every time I kept talking, you like leaned in. I could see you on the. Uh, video. Oh, you know what I was trying to do is I was trying to figure out where you were. I was oh. watching your background. I'm like, none of those buildings look familiar. <laughs> uh, and Tyler was chiming in from his job site, but he had to actually take off because he's wrapping up a job right before Christmas. He's and making this it is, happen. This is our la- well, last podcast of 2018. Maybe. That is true. Maybe. I don't see how it's going to get. <laughs> Maybe we'll do another. Um, but no, we're sitting here with Zach and, and talking about the craftsmanship behind paint. Uh, which, which is not, I, I I think some people listen to this and may think it's a stretch. Being being honest with you. Yeah. I think people may Agreed. think that. And it's, it's not though. I'm going to be honest. He reached out to me and he was like, I want to just show you some samples. And I'm like... I don't want to see. He just, Nick just rolled his eyes. <laughs> I did. Of course, though. Do, do the emoji thing with the rolled eyes. <laughs> um, and I, I remember sitting. We met at Starbucks, and you handed me sa- they're sitting. I think on the shelf out there. And I was I think like, I've seen those. I was like, wait, this is brush, and this is drywall, and this is and and it was just when you started, you got you went super nerd on yeah, me. Yeah. And I was like I pigments that. and fillers. He blacked out. I was like, dude. <laughs> I was like, get me another nitro. Uh, but then it was like, it really, it made sense from where, like you weren't even, you weren't, it wasn't that you were trying to sell what you do. You were trying to get me to understand it. Educate. And educate me. And then when, when we left, I was, I told you, I was all for it. I was like, that, this makes sense. Like I want, I want this not just for you, but I also want like the guys I use to understand it and like to, uh, to, and but for me as a general contractor to realize that you know when he says he needs two weeks he needs three and it's all like I always combat the schedule thing and like I always want to give people the time that they deserve and like it's not always there and like Johnny you deal with it all the time it's like schedule schedule it's like you we there well if I have to give it to you then I have to give it to everybody and right? let's be honest that schedule can't adopt that much time and it's like where do you well push and pull Right. It, I mean, it, air quotes can, but it's that's the industry standard is it doesn't like you overlap trades. And yeah. that's it's I mean, just, it, just to create efficiency. I mean, it's like right. anything, but I mean, you're right on. I, I think one of the things that like I'm learning it right now where we were trying to understand early in the podcast, how do you understand and, and see that value in a good painter? And I also think early on, like Nick said, you know, I had it same. Our clients would want to pull the paint out and do it themselves. I also think that's at the level of execution that us, the GC contractor builder, is putting out. Meaning, you're not going to be able to see the difference between mom and dad painting that room with your craftsmanship, with the crown and everything else. Because let's be honest, in the beginning, it wasn't all you know crisp like Tommy Silva. Mm-hmm. And as like I have an issue right now where you know I'm one of my specs, it's a great house, it's phenomenal. The problem is I did such a nice job with tile and cabinetry and beaded inset and flooring and unbelievable details that you know what sticks out is the paint job. Yeah. And it's I was able to understand that because these people aren't educated in this industry. They don't see it. They see it because when they sit in the kitchen and the kitchen is majority cabinetry and the couple pieces of trim that are in there, you're like, wait a minute. And I learned it on early on when I did a ballroom in Newton where we had this guy's seven star painting. I'm like five wasn't enough. Seven star <laughs> painting. He might still be in the business, but that guy was an architect and, and I did all the trim in that house. Just painstakingly dialed it in, coffered ceiling, the whole nine. And he goes, Now just watch out because a, 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 any painter can come in and ruin all the work you just did. Right. And that's, I think, a builder, a contractor, a GC needs to understand that the investment you put in the, the five months prior to the paint getting done, that you can't let someone ruin it. We're and the icing ha- on the cake. Yeah, it really is. It's And for people to understand it, that's what took me so long to get it, was that, yeah, as you raise your bar for cabinetry, like tile, we even joked about it today, where they were like, yeah, tile's great. I'm like, your tile's good in a lot of rooms. <laughs> but the fact that your master is all slab work, it then puts in perspective what could like, be. Like when you go to a hotel, you're like, wow, this place is unreal. Because it all matches up. And you go home and it's like that, you know, the, the grout's a little stained. Mm-hmm. The tile's not a little. Le- it's not level. It's it's about perception and understanding what it is. And I think that's harder to do when, when the whole house levels off. 
like I said to them today, I'm like, hey, you know, this other spec you were going to buy for X amount of money, the whole house would match this paint job. So you wouldn't know the difference. It doesn't stick out. This was a conversation you had? Yeah, today. Had that conversation today. What's the, so what's the verdict? Oh, you sh- my IG story where I asked for a new paint crew. Because mm-hmm. I'm all about giving people a long leash in, in trying to educate them. But like today, they're doing, they're, doing, they're, they're patching a couple of holes where we move some electrical down for uh, a TV. And I'm watching them. I'm just sitting there, you know, kind of juggling a bunch of, I'm trying to bring a bunch of people in for the punch just to kind of see what's going on. And these guys come in, thank God they had drop cloths because usually it's my moving blankets. And, and the guy's sanding it and he's rubbing his hand across it. And I'm reading that going, he thinks it's smooth. And I'm like, dude, you got to go out to the truck, get a floodlight, throw the floodlight on. You're not, your hand's not going to be able to see <laughs> those imperfections. And then you're going to complain that you have to come back and do the paint again. I'm like, I'm trying to educate you on what to do. And he go, sends a guy off the truck, doesn't have a floodlight, takes his phone, and his phone's like guiding it to try and see where the imperfections are. And I'm like, dude, how, how am I going to? I can't keep telling you everything. Right. And it just just going right through the sponge. Like it's just not. And I'm just like, you know what? I can't. Why would I do this to myself again on the next house? But. Because you're, clo- you're, you're close. You're, you're going to be priming soon. Oh, yeah. That's why I'm like, I got to make this jump. Mm. And it's, I got a bunch of guys that, honestly, it's it's so weird, Instagram, where you, I put it out there, and then you respond to people's DMs, and it's like, oh, I've had long conversations with these guys, and they're right next door. Why did I not take advantage of this before? I got a Medfield painter. I got another one that's, you know, another local builder that uses a guy. He's like, he's great. If you direct him, he'll do it. That's what I need. Mm-hmm. It's like a good kid on the ice. There's, like you get to a point where it's like I don't need you to be very talented. I need you to be like Receptive. teachable. Yeah. If you're a teachable kid or a subcontractor, like I'm not gonna I'm gonna save you time, money, and effort if you just listen. Right. And it would be great. Like going back to Zach is that I am dying to get to a point where I can bring back Francisco. Like I remember when I, like you said like educating people and that. Like I remember telling Benny, I'm like Benny, this this rental we're doing at the last company, I'm like there's no budget here. Like, so you can bring in what you need. Like, you need to find out what real painting is. And he's been in the industry for a long time. It's just, I was so, like, I, I can't even, like, you know it because you're in it. And I understand how kind of romantic and how you can get sucked into it. Where, like, when Francisco took over the house, I said this before on another podcast, like, he would do such a, a bang up job with his crew to do all the prep work that everyone else would sense it and know it, where they'd be like, I'm going to carry two guys going to carry that stick of lumber in or whatever that detail is instead of just so-and-so bumping his way along <laughs> with the back end of that, you know, stud or whatever it is, the handrail hitting everything. People respected the amount of work that went into that. And I think a lot of people don't know that unless, I mean, it's, it's weird. I don't get that from your IG though. I wish you, I could get that. I wish people, I could send people to your IG and go, yeah, this is the process. Like, and it's tough to do in a one minute video and, in, on stories, and it's, I don't know if you can without having some sort of documentary. Do you follow uh, Shoreline? Is that right? Yeah. Do you Shoreline. follow Shoreline Painting? I don't know. So he's he, he he's the 100 man crew that you're talking about, right? Yeah. And he's got the 12 guys that do the fine paint and then the 80 guys that do more traditional. But what you, you just talked about how people walk through that house and feel as though two people should carry that stick of lumber. That guy, you follow his stories and his posts. He, he's got, when he finishes a job and you walk in that house, you don't want to touch anything. Yeah. There's you, signs. You feel responsible there for is signs nicking everywhere. something. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. signs. Hey, just so you know, trim's painted. You dick, you, you, you nick it, you're you getting back charged. It. It's the same as someone, like, nicking a floor. Yeah. Like, there's there's that level of responsibility for finishes, but I think paint really gets the, the word just paint. Oh, yeah. We'll just Come, touch it up. Well, it's just, like, I, I, do, I, fall, I do fall into that where when it comes to colors, I'm like... It's not that bad. We can always put another coat on. Like, yeah. and I, I, that's the most that I dig into it. But I do believe in, like you said earlier in the podcast, that like it should be magic. People trying to figure out how the trim was basically applied to the wall. It looks. It should look like it was CNC. Right. You should not have a clue. Molded onto the wall. Yeah. Exactly. So ha- actually, this look. is a this is a question. Who's trim guys go in? They do casing, flat stock, right? Mitered corners, and the seams a little off. Who's responsible for making it seamless? I am, but I, I, I was gonna say trim. Yeah, same here. 
I just like had I tell my guys, guy I want that day. every seam to be flat. Sand but, but it. They, but they sand it. Like there was yeah. a long time where I didn't know that as a carpenter. For and a long time, we were filling all our nail holes, doing the first round. But you, but it was yeah true. And then I, I actually don't know that. But it's I think I didn't know that I was supposed to fill glue and then sand that miter clean for mm-hmm. that painter right. coming down the line. Because I feel like that's I mean, not as much now, but like early on, it was such a battle. I was like, well, you guys didn't fill it. Why would I? Why would I flush out the trim? So then I was like, well. Can you can like can I pay a little extra to flush out the trim? And I was like, wait, why are we, the trim should be installed flush anyway? But if it's a little off, why like my guy should be doing it because they should be leaving it for the next trade. Like as it, it's bring it to the lo- yeah. I I have to I have to sit with you. If I'm gonna do a project with you. I'm gonna sit and I'm gonna go. Well, what's what are what are you gonna do and what am I gonna do? And then I can give you a price. But at the end of the day, if it's if you don't give me flat stock that's flush, I'm the painter. I have to make it flat. Right. So, or, you know, it, it depends on, to me, it all comes down to, well, what was the price point that mm-hmm. we got this job at? And if you grinded me on price, well then of course I, I'm not saying that. Mm-hmm. But if you didn't grind me on price and I give you a number, it's expected that you're going to get a certain level of quality. Right. But, you know, we haven't worked together yet. I think we're going to, but I just met with the guy yesterday and I, big, he, big dog's not listening. No, Big Dog's doing the same job he's doing. <laughs> They're working together. They work together. But I, I, and I looked at him. I said, well, what is the level of skill of the carpenters that are going to come ahead of me? You know, you want, he wants a price on a remodel that he's doing. He's GCing it himself. And I said, well, what's the skill level? Because I just followed some carpenters the other day. I think they took all the trim and threw it off the roof first and then installed it. Like, it was horrific. Fun. And – if that it was for a designer in her own house and you know it was not for a client and, and the budget wasn't there for us to go fix all that stuff but if it was if that was for one of our clients i would have given a back charge of 50 percent of the total job would have mm-hmm. been a back charge just to make that trim look good because it was bad carpentry but again it's all expectations up front we have to talk and we have to really know but i'm a professional i think a lot of the painters in this in in the in the trades they're squeezed on price, but they're also not real craftsmen. I mean, I was having this conversation with Tyler. I wish he was on still. Is that it's twofold? There's a lot of guys out there doing a really <laughs> paint job and getting paid good money. That's the other because, side of it because it's there right now. Yeah, it, it yeah. exactly. It's yeah. it, it doesn't matter. It's just it's really tough when it's really tough to fight the good fight that you're fighting. Yeah, when. You look at guys and you look at the paint job, and then you go, "How much did you pay?" And you're like, "Don't, don't look at this podcast no, I know, paint I know. job." <laughs> he caught me, but it's it's he was like, tough. Well, it, it's and it goes across the board from, you know, Tyler was talking to me about his, his countertop guy. It, it just no one cares, and people get away with sin. And there's a lot of guys that call themselves professionals. Yeah. That's why I wanted to dig into like '01 with your dad, and then going to '06, and then going. That makes you a seasoned guy. Yeah. Forget about professional, like in 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 being you know. What's the word I'm looking for? A uh, not an entrepreneur, but a you start out in the industry. You need to have more of an electrician's hat. Apprentice. 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 Yeah. Like it's, you have all that underneath your belt. There's guys out here that just started a year ago. I see it all the time. I see people on Instagram, and they say the professionals, or on these Facebook forums of painters, and and it's like. I tell people, people will reach out to me and I'm like, the first thing you need to do is you need to shut down your business and go work for somebody who knows what they're doing and do it until you're, you think you're better than your boss. Yeah. Don't start working for yourself until you think you're better than your boss. Cause your boss is established already. He already has a reputation. His, he's already invested the money. You're going to try to start from scratch and compete in a market. If you're not better than your boss, I, I don't see why you'd ever go into business. You can then have failures and mistakes under their wing and under their education yes. and and you can do that i'm so with you on that there's someone that comes to mind that i'm not going to talk about that just keeps wanting to like it's hard not to fail right now okay yeah and it's not going to be like that forever yeah and that's what that's what's crazy to me is that everyone's just rolling it and slinging stuff against the wall and it's sticking and they're going and then they call themselves successful the last five years have been a cakewalk. Yeah. And and to not do what you two are doing, Nick and, and Zach, 
is elevating your game to get into that upper echelon where the recession doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. That's what I was trying to get to earlier with my question is that do you think that it's going to still be there and you don't want to be the last guy in? Because all these other established guys, I think you need to get there, what Nick's doing and what you're doing, because you're going to have a bunch of guys that hit this next recession that just fuzz out and want to leave, retire, don't sell the business, just close the shop, and you need to be there to take those spots. Yeah. But staying mediocre in this industry right now, when it's you can elevate yourself, is... That's the most dangerous. Position. It's the it's wicked. It's you're it's a detriment. You're better to your off being like the, the 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 low level guy because you're gonna sh- you shut it down, not have as much commitment with right. with employees and yeah. everything else, and then you're gonna go work for somebody. Right. But being in the middle where you have six, seven, ten, whatever guys, these guys always, on both sides of you. Yeah. You're a commodity. Yeah. When, when you're a commodity, if you don't have hard skills and and a real value proposition, tomorrow, like if I can replace you tomorrow. It's as easy as making a phone call. Like, there's no job security. No, nope. there's like that. I've been there. I've seen all that stuff, and you know, you feel it. I've I've had those hard times. I've had those like a winter where it was just like, holy, <laughs> I don't know how I'm gonna eat. Like, how are we gonna get? But like, all right, I gotta start listening and thinking and doing things differently. So, so take take us back to when you transitioned from a painter, just a regular Joe Schmo painter, yep. putting on your two coats, walking away. Still seeing some nail holes. I don't know if that was you in particular, but explain to me how you then evolved. Like, it wasn't like you just was like, all right, I got these cool paints. Yeah. I'm doing cool stuff now. No, like, I, I what actually. What was the learning curve? So I was I was reading uh, an article. I found a random article one time. I used to spend hours and hours and hours on paint talk and read every forum and watch John Shear's YouTube videos and all sorts of stuff. And I, I found out about this wood preservative that uh, this old house article, the painter was doing his own house and they stripped it to bare wood and they used a wood preservative on the wood before they primed and painted. And I was like, I've never heard of that. Let me go down that rabbit hole. I, I started using it and it, and so, and then I found a better one. But you started using that on what? Your own house? On, 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 on Cause a we project? were stripping a lot of projects. Like we'd show up, uh, there was a, pr- the first job we used it on was a, a, a two-year-old paint job on a large cedar shake shingle house it's painted cedar shakes we stripped that whole house i lost my shirt on it because i didn't realize how much it was going to cost to strip a house of cedar shakes but we stripped it for like a month straight took every ounce of paint off that place and then we put this wood preservative on <laughs> cedar God. shakes so, so when you did that you you bid the job and you hadn't learned about the preservative right just I, walk me through that and I, then- no i i found i knew about the preservative and it was in the back of my head and but I walked to this try job it. and I so wanted to use it. you did this out of your own pocket yeah. to kind of evolve. I lost 15000 I mean, I, that job today, I would do that job for 60000 I probably did it for fourteen. <laughs> like, like, it, it was an absolute insane thing. But but what happened was... It, Nick, Nick would chalk that up to marketing. Well, see, I learned from him <laughs> the other day. Budget. I would like, I needed to document that. I never called the photographer afterwards. That was my mistake. But yeah. I had I had this experience where... What ended up happening was, so that I did that job and it was, I just knew, like I knew in my heart that was the best paint job I could have ever put on that thing. And then that guy had a leak at, in a second floor slider. All the water was getting in through the, the sill and it rotted out his whole basement um, exterior wall. And the paint was perfect. Mm. It was getting soaked from behind, but where the paint met the wood could not get wet because there was a wood preservative on there. So he had perfect paint and a whole soaking wet house. So I had this, I, now I had evidence. Like it was in theory, now I had evidence. This is the way to go. So then I was like, well, I did it. I did another job and it was, uh, we used Sherman Williams Emerald right when it came out. It was a top of line, $70 a gallon paint. And we put it on and it faded. Four years, three years later, it, it had faded in color. And I was pissed. And eventually I found Fine Paints of Europe primarily because of exterior because it doesn't Mm. fade in color nearly as fast i started going "Well, what's the paint that's going to last the longest if i put this wood preservative on first so that's how i found fine paints of europe and i did a bunch of work i i figured out they had the certification program i got nominated by my dealer my paint dealer because he knew i was a giant paint nerd can we pump the brakes on that like what does that mean so like this, you can get you can get hardy certifications. Yeah, so like that's so, just kind of going there, sitting for a ten minute class, and you're good to go. I know I'm just, yeah, 
For those that can't see it, he's got a fancy patch on yeah. his shirt. Master shit. It's kind of like Boy Scouts. It's, he has a little vest but, that goes across. So your paint <laughs> dealer has to nominate you. So I have a relationship with my paint dealer. He's a big paint nerd too. And you were so, buying this stuff locally. Yeah. And Not you know, Europe. It, it, yes. <laughs> so to be honest, I wasn't using a lot of that paint yet. I wanted to use a lot of it. And I had, I, I kind of had, I understood you wanted, it was going to be hard to you, sell it. You wanted to use it so you wouldn't have as many callbacks. Yeah. I wanted. Oh, I I had. To, don't know why, but I had this weird obsession. I wanted to paint a job and have it last as long as possible. Like, you know, it's kind of weird when you think about it. It's not job good security. business, but yeah, yeah. I wanted. I was always almost obsession. I wanted a paint job to last so long, um, because I wanted to be in this game for a long time, and I knew it would look good to say this is ten years old, still looking great. So, I figured out they had the certification program, and I thought if I was certified, I could sell this paint easier because I already knew it was going to be a tough sell. So I did everything it took and I, I got nominated a couple of years. It took me to get in to be certified. So they nominate you. They do all this stuff. They, they do their background. They figure out if you're, they were so it's like or an not. exclusive thing, not just that yeah. anyone can get the company decides whether or not you can come up and get certified. And it's a very small group of people. So that was three years ago. I showed up and it, I was like, my people were all there. It was like, where like the biggest paint nerds in the country had come from all over. Most of them were very established. I was the secretly, I hadn't used it much. Like I, everyone else were these huge companies, super high end. And they were just doing it to like move the marketing to a next level. But I met all these human beings that were amazing. And I was like, I, I mean, I couldn't sleep. I came home for, I could not sleep. I was like invigorated. So, and I met this one guy, That's Adam awesome. Fox, and, and all he used was fine paints of Europe. I sat next to him. He said, all I use is fine paints of Europe. And he had this picture. It was fine paints of Europe, color of the year, two years ago. It's a green, high-gloss room. It's the most amazing thing you've ever, like a whole room high-gloss oil, automotive sp smooth. It's unbelievable. And so I'm talking to him. He's like, yeah, I, all I do is fine paints of Europe. And it kind of put it in my head. And, and so I went away from that, and I started down this road I, I again. I did a, a staircase job. I, I went and upgraded my next project. I was sitting there in that room going, I got to use this stuff. My I had a project booked, uh, for, like a remodel interior, and I upgraded the paint. It cost me like $12,000 out of pocket to upgrade the paint to Fine Paints of Europe. And I did that. And and that's like that started me down this path. And then I, I got more and more into it, and I decided like I'm – and I was having a tough time selling it still because I'm like, oh, or we could do this thing called Fine Paints. So I was like, finally, like, you know what? I hired this consultant and I decided like the best way to sell this is to, to commit. So this consultant was what? He was a, he was a successful paint contractor who like almost died of cancer and like came back and decided to not start his company again, but to consult. And he has a great relationship with fine paints. So and like he, he's he a mentor. It. Yeah. He, he kind of came in. I, to be honest, I originally hired him thinking I was going to learn about like how to better apply the paint. Mm. And he came for three days and like all we talked about was like the business of painting and how to sell this stuff is really what I got out of it. And that's what changed my whole perspective on this, like the painting and what I was doing. So once I went down that road and I, and I was like, at a certain point, I just decided I'm only using this for now on, like this is what I'm going to do. And I went really hard down that path and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed and I got really good and at that point, I and I had a good relationship with the owner of Fine Paints. So at that point, I kind of was like, I, I came to him. I was like, "What does it take to become master certified?" And like, I'm doing everything I want, like everything I can do. I want to sell this stuff, and so eventually, he was like, "You know, we he." So was this certification so you get leads from? So from I get leads from them. I'm on the site, but it's on the side of my truck. It's on every piece of everything you could like. I wear this shirt to every estimate, like. It's just one more thing to kind of go like white after Labor Day, huh? Yeah, I know. It's I'm just saying, you might want to get color on it. Yeah, a little bit, a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> just <laughs> total right turn, left turn. But it, it was like all those things because I knew I've I'd already experienced this. I knew so. Yes, back to what we originally started with. Like I was always trying to push the limits of what my client would pay me to do because I just I wanted to do better. But you you weren't just doing that and just throwing in the pricing and going a good, better, best price. You were pricing it out as you were in the beginning, as you evolved, and then just upgrading the product to, to, to get familiar with it on your terms. 
not putting it on someone else to pay for, and then yeah. you screw up or whatever. And I think that's what a lot of people do. I mean, mm-hmm. I know I've done it not just about paint, but all different products. My entire the so I I've been working for myself now for seven years. I've been, I would say I've been in business for two years. Like I'm trying to run a business. I was going to say they get now. easier at the five. How, like the first five years was me working for myself. Like I started seven years ago with a uh, Ford Taurus and a little giant and a, and a couple paintbrushes. Like I moved home from Philadelphia because my dad is an alcoholic that went off the rails. Um, Sorry, yeah. So I, and that's why I don't drink and, or do drugs because I know I, I'm, I got a long history of that. Yeah. Um, but I came home and I just had to like survive like $15 an hour, seven years ago, I was $15 an hour for a friend's dad who was flipping a house painting, you know, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And, and it like literally just went one job after another where I was just like super over executing and getting paid like nothing to do it. And it was like the staircase. How that you tough talk was about. that? Like, How tough was that to keep doing and keep brutal. pushing? It was brutal. Like I, for a while it was crazy. Like I didn't know what I was doing and I was just like, I couldn't ever cut a corner. And so I, I could, it's, it helped that I but wasn't did really anyone into notice? the numbers. I don't know. I knew I, I could sleep at night. Yeah. So I, I was kinda, never really good impressive. at the numbers. Like still, I'm not very good at following the numbers. I like, so I was doing these jobs cause you're not alone. <laughs> we just looked at each other. <laughs> like God, I, if I was so number good. driven, I would have <laughs> cut out all of these jobs and cut all these corners. I would have had to, right. to make, to make a profit. But I was so into the craftsmanship of it. That's what led, to be honest, a lot of that's what led me here. Like, I don't want to be, I don't want to compete on price because I like, I mean, everyone wants that. Yeah. It's just, you have to have the, the education, the charisma, the drive and the passion and to be able to execute it. There's, there's, yeah. I don't know how many of those were, but you literally can't do it without one. The whole package. Exactly. It has to be everything, everything. and time. And I don't have kids. I just got married. I don't have kids. Like, Congrats. Good I luck. can take huge <laughs> risks. Yeah. Like, I just put a $30,000 spray booth in my shop. Like, I'm never doing that if I have a family to support. Like, it's a huge risk. You will. Like, yeah, I know. I, I, you I, say that, but I know, you I li- will. I listen yeah, you to you. You won't change. It, it's, no, it's, like, it's I just made nature. the move a year ago. It's yeah. almost a year ago tomorrow. And it's just like, and that was big. It was that, hey, it, it's, we had that question asked to us at the JLC last year. And they were like, what's it like running your own business? And for years, we've been doing talks, and it's always been like, how's social media? How is this? And then I'm sitting there with no review, and they're like, so what's it like having a new company? And I'm like, uh, big fat <laughs> goose eggs. I was yeah. like, so many things raced through my mind at that moment where I was like, it sucks. It's yeah. super difficult. There's n- You have no free time. And when you do, you try and plug into your kids. Like It's literally like plugging, unplugging from one one like plug into another. Right. You can't like not commit, meaning just kind of go half seas. You have <laughs> yeah, to yeah. totally be in it. So your kids are like, I get it. And it, it's, it's, me and scary. Zach were talking about that before. It's like the, I mean, that's what the pre- you know, premise of what we do is kind of talking about the honesty and like how, how it does suck and like the difficulties that we face and talking about. I mean, Brian's episode was awesome with the work life balance. And I think it hit home with a lot of people, myself included. But, I mean, well, that's, I mean, you, you, you guys. I mean, I'm not saying you guys, but I mean, I have an 11. That's why Brian and I clicked a little bit more because our kids are closer in age. He's got a jump start on me, but it's like I would never tell you guys to do what I did. Same as Brian when mm-hmm. I was younger. I would advise everyone right. to not. It's not worth it. It's absolutely not worth it. And you know, I think I'm very lucky with the situation I'm with 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 my wife and my kids. That my wife didn't like just I come home at like 3 a.m. and the house be empty. <laughs> like yeah. You get me like that could have just as easily have happened mm. instead of me having the family I have right now. Because like Tyler always says on the podcast, this well recently is that we always as like you said, your numbers, you never really do your numbers. It's the project first. For me, like this year and having my business this year, it's like, no, I'm not going to squeeze myself, whether it's time or. Or, or budget, like, meaning if I have a company credit card, I, I always sucked on when I worked for other people. I would always, to keep the job moving, I'd put stuff on my card. And then when it came to reimbursements, I, it would kind of shake out how it shook out. And I'd probably lose 10 to 15 grand a year. And it sounds crazy, but like now, like having one card that's just for the business, 
and that gets paid directly by the accountant, the bookkeeper. Like, I don't have to like freak out about all that stuff. And it's it's a business. If the if the business is squeezed, I need to invoice more instead of the business keep trucking along, and then I have to have that conversation on a Sunday with my wife before the bills do. That hey, we need, we're squeezed on this, it, and that's how it was forever. And it and I think it's experience, like what you're saying about elevating your business. It's about that experience, meaning you've done all that long enough to realize there is another level and a level beyond that and a level beyond this. And with social media, it is easy. I think that was my point I was going back to is that you guys should be able to elevate so much quicker because it's right there. It's like talking about schooling. I had encyclopedias. Yeah. Now the internet. You're foolish if you're still looking stuff up, like in a <laughs> book. It just, my kids are just so much. I look at wh- where they are at like 7 and 11 compared to where I was at 7 and 11. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. I feel like an idiot already. I feel like my kids are already smarter than me, and I'm 39. And it's for the industry part of it, if you guys, you guys can have your questions answered tomorrow. Right. Yeah. You used to have to, like, write a letter to a manufacturer to get an answer, and now it's like DM them and you're there. Right. It's crazy to me how how fruitless people are being with this when you can get all your answers and you're not doing it. Well, I, I – we. I have some friends that we, we like talk, we like share openly all our secrets and there's like, there is We're talking about paint. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> rabbit hole. <laughs> but, Wait a minute. but that like, we live in a new world now where like, there's some, like there's, there's a, a spectrum of people uh, uh, as to how open they want to be about their, their trade secrets. And I, I've been, I've experienced it because I like, I am of the mindset like like we're risk takers like i'm like i'm pretty self-confident in like what in my skills and like i'm not worried like i went out and did this crazy stuff but so i'm more than happy to like essentially share everything like unless you're the dude i'm bidding against tomorrow like and even then i kind of like i skew heavily toward like being an open book Mm -hmm. as it relates to this stuff this is what it comes down to nick and i used to talk about this all the time we'll give it all away Let's just be frank. Like Gary Vee will say, yeah. you're not going to work as hard as me. Yeah, I know. I'll give you everything. And yes. even if they do, they're going it's still a diff- like it's still a different execution. They're not me. Maybe you yeah. maybe you put 100 uh, 90% into something that I put 80 and I put 20% into something you're putting 10. Yeah. It's just it like that's how I've always been and it's it, it's I see benefit after benefit on it. I've never seen any negativity from it. And, and that's mm-hmm. how I am. But I also have this group of people who I'm sharing, and I want to be able to share both ways. Your dark with. secrets. And <laughs> yes, the dark. But it, if they like, so it, it's been. It's so just, are they it's, not sharing with you? Not yet. But I don't want to lose that, right? Hold on. So what's the value there? No, they they are, we share everything. Yeah. yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Like, but what value. I'm saying <laughs> is like, there like there are some stuff that. What do you doesn't wanna, bother what do you me learn? because I'm selling. I'm selling my jobs. Like I'm good at the sales process to get this done. There are a number of painters who can find out the sprayer that I'm using and what I'm doing roughly and c- undercut me and come in there. But I'm banking on like my clients again, aren't going to try to save that $10,000, but there's many clients who are going to try to save that $10,000. But again, it's like the stuff you talk about, like, if I'm raising the level, if more guys are going to go out there and sell a fine paints of Europe paint job, I feel like it's good for me. Dude, rising tide raises all boats. It's but, it's a slam dunk. It's just it's being comfortable with yourself in that. Hey, there's a there's been years of industries. I know Gerton will say no, it wasn't like that. We always shared. There's a small niches here and there. I'm saying from personal experience and talking to lumberyards all over the place that said what we're doing right now with this community is new it's raw yeah like it doesn't exist where people can openly talk about everything from margin i, I was i was at the bruins game last night talking to a designer bridget and she's like yeah we have a group of, the, of designers that are well established the first four seconds after talking to them about like what her business is about they're like what's your margin give me the description of the job what are you making and they correct her right there it's not like hey let's pussyfoot around this and let's say what do you do you know why it's because they don't want to waste their time with a stay-at-home mom that thinks that she's an interior designer. Yes. Why would they even bother having yes. that conversation from the mentoring thing? Right. But it is like the technology is changing our 
the, our realities. And so it's like now I have to deal with this. It's a thing I have to think about because I can so easily show my entire process and be an open book and everyone in the country can see it. it it's something I have to start to think about because they're... But you also have to, like, I, I also skew this another way is that if you're not going to be an open book, someone else is, why not be the professional in the field? Why not be the guy that gives all the information? Because otherwise, someone else does it, and then your credit, like your exposure, is now dwindled because you're sitting here trying to hold everything. I think tight. it's the same as I mean. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like when I talk to clients, and my job is to present all the options. Yeah. If I hold something back, and they have an architect friend come over, and they go, "Hey, why didn't you talk about doing copper on the roof?" Oh, my builder didn't tell me about it. That's yeah. why I look at it like you're your not, credibility, your credibility drops. junk. And it's it's it. I look at it that way across the industry. That hey, if I don't show it all, I don't care if I have fifty thousand followers or if I have thirty or someone ramped their way up. It doesn't matter. I'm telling my genuine story yeah. that no one else can. And it's I think that's the raw part about it is that hey, and I'm not saying it, it, it's a bulletproof system. I think we're always learning. These podcasts are just as invaluable to me as they are to people listening to it because, it, like we talk about, it, it makes us – my drive back home right now, 45 to an hour, I will just be drilling down. I might be listening to another podcast, whether it's Barstool or whatever. I will be thinking about my processes. Mm -hmm. What am I doing from this paint podcast and how you elevated your game? What am I doing to elevate my game? Is it enough? Even though I do it a ton and I'm striving for it, it's like – Am I doing enough? Was this? Do you look back at where you are now? And I know it's only been three years since you've been working with that. The goals that you set three years ago, have they been fizzled out or have they been clouded by other things that you found results in? I don't know if I phrased that right. So, like, yeah. So, I think we were talking about this before. Like, I used to, I needed to eat. I would take on any job. You, you name it. If you're going to pay me to do it, apply a coding, like, I was going to do it. And we did everything. So you're buying a tool for this and you use it one time because you never do that job again. And I went through my whole career working for myself doing that, just taking on whatever. And it was inefficient. I was not profitable doing one thing today, one thing the next day, never have the right tool with you. We keep the same tools with us all the time. We use the same stuff all the time. We're doing the same processes over and over again. We're getting better at them. We're more efficient. We know our stuff. Like, to me, eventually, I was just like, that's the way to go. It's like, I need to specialize for for sales, but also for productivity. And and that's where, like, my goal now is like, okay, my I know there's this, my ideal client is out there. If I put them all in a circle, there's, there's this group of people who are my ideal client. How, now, every day I wake up, how can I best serve them? And, and everybody else can screw. Like, I used to go, well, I, like, may, maybe I... How do I just serve these people? Because I don't. You guys all know them. Your best clients. I have some amazing clients that are highly profitable. They love me, and we serve them perfectly. How do I find more of those? We just did that red door the other day. I, that client was so happy. They paid me a lot of money to do that red door, and then they gave me a big bonus on top of it, and we're thrilled. Okay. Well, how do I? How do I? Because I serve them perfect. But you know what I love is that that wasn't the goal. That hasn't yeah. been the goal for you from the start. It's about executing. And with that execution and the passion, it, those bonuses will be there. Yeah. There's, I, don't, I mean, I'm speaking for you, but I feel like I've never gone into a house expecting a bonus from a client. Ever. Ever. And then when you get it, it's like, boom, yeah. man. Whoa. That's that's awesome. It's like it, a wake-up call yeah. to say, like, I – You appreciate my it. Fear, my thesis is, like, yep. is, is being proven correct. If I just obsess on how to meet this one client's needs better than than anybody else, that means everybody else. Like, yeah, I'm. I say no, and it's so pain. I still have it, but I'm getting used to that feeling of like, no. Like, I have, I have architects, designers, builders who are like, well, what? If, I just got some feedback the other day. Like, what if you thought about doing like maybe stepping it down and not saying you only use fine paints of Europe? Like that has been an unbelievably painful thing to say. I do. And I'm like, well, maybe they, it might be in the back of my head right now. I may have already asked that question once. Yeah, but but to me, it's because like, yeah. Now, if I'm for the right client, am I going to go? Yeah, we can put some Sherwin Williams in your bat in your closets. Of course, right. But if I go around say acting, if that's kind that's of the way you it is, promote, it's not yeah. what I want to promote. But you know what's crazy is that I'm going to turn this back on myself because when you're saying that, I'm thinking about my my journey. 
and yeah, I could do custom homes. I would love to do just custom renovations and that stuff. But there's part of me that wants to do the specs to show the rest of the spec market what real value is. So while you're saying that, I'm like, what would it take to put a four to five, whatever your secret little weapon is for your crew size, that basically silver bullet, do that with your techniques, with that lower level paint product, and just totally rock that additional high-end market of normal paints. I see. Like I, that, I think I'm, you're crazy. I think the spec market for your skill set is crazy. Yeah. No, I know. I, I think like just from the outside, there's a company in my state and they specialize in high end construction faster than anybody else. They're the most expensive by far, but they'll get your project done on time. You name the budget, the timeline. They did a three and a half year build in 18 months. They tented the entire there was a half a million dollar enclosure over the property just to get work year round and get the project done. Right. For what little I know about you, like you have the ability to get projects done incredibly efficiently. Like why not triple down on serving the clients who want high end and fast on me. Mm -hmm. Didn't I ask the question? I know. I think I'm going to leave. And so, so you guys can jam. This <laughs> <That was> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Did he just do that? <laughs> no, I, I'm with you. I mean, but like, cause I sat down, I was like, what is my skill set? And how do I highly leverage my skill set and my biology, my nature? Well, to me, that's where I'm kind of landing where I think my skill set and my nature, I'm the I'm, I'm like highly specialized at. Like I can add the most value doing what I'm doing today, based off my knowledge. Agree, but isn't there a part of you that wants to see, be a little bit diversified so that way you can do both? Well, I can always I can always put some Sherwin Williams paint on a wall. That like. But so can everybody else. Yeah, but you can't do that with your current bandwidth. So if you were to take, like, to do that very high-end stuff, people aren't going to want you. Like, in our market, like, if I build a, a 12,000 square foot house, they may not want me doing, they see me on social media or whatever marketing, doing that one powder room that's 10 grand. They don't jive. The execution, unless it's unbelievable, the level of execution for that powder room, why would I waste my time and my resources my point is, is that you can't pull your crew off to go do that work. They they are bulletproof. They have their steps. It's like clockwork. Well, I think that's where that's. I mean, that like Shoreline, they ha they're separate. Yeah, but yeah. I'm saying not grow a hundred. Like it's the same question I have about R and R, Kyle. Mm -hmm. If you're just banging out the market, and you're unbelievable. Want to create a bigger family? You're talking double in sizes, two more people, and just take the whole market over. Why would you only limit yourself to have that high? And I'm. I know you can point the finger right back at me and I'm totally comfortable with that. <laughs> it's just, why not grab that four man crew and just crush that market? You get to sit back. I don't, I'm, I don't know if you're actually still swinging a paintbrush rarely, but I do. So it's, I, it, I get, you could manage I get both those crews and kill two markets, like murder it. And then the economy takes a turn or whatever. And then you pull those other six guys from the high end market down to this market and just keep motoring and then keep going. I just, I, I don't think, I think like a, all the best companies, they stay highly specialized. That's since when? Since when? Because, uh, I, I mean, look at like all the because big it, companies when they start to do a bunch Johnny's of stuff. Level down, no, but I'm saying like that wasn't always the case. Like a true G, I'm looking at my, yeah, a but, true GC, they don't exist. But you're a talking general. about our, our industry. But I think, I don't think paint was ever like, that, that specialized either. Well, look at how many, like I'm talking about corporations. Like big corporations, like we, the the GEs of the world, when they decided to get really into. Piss me off. <laughs> hey, Kevin. Like, are we gonna go that route? But like, I just think there's like in business and the way human nature is, and like company culture, like it's important. It is a thing, and mm, and hands down. And like that's where like you look at when it, when GE and all these any of these big companies they they get so big and they take on forty different divisions, and then they were like, wait. What are we even doing? And yeah, bring like, it back to the roots. Yeah, but, like, but why what do we it, do better that, than anybody why does that else? Jump need to go to f like GE. Uh, so, I'm talking. About, but I'm I just, not, I'm just using it as a metaphor. I know. My favorite business book is Understanding Michael Porter, yeah. and and that idea of competitive advantage. Like, really, what is your competitive advantage? And and just doubling and tripling down on that and leveraging the hell out of that. Anytime you take a step and do something that's not directly in line with that. It, it, like I'm just saying, you're. I, I could be crazy. I'm like, saying uh, your model doesn't change, your technique doesn't change. I know you're just able to 
get like you're not compromising anything. You're just putting a different paint that is still top of the line for that market for that four million dollar house. I just feel like if you put relation, not you. I'm saying if the relationship that you're trying to build with that that builder that's doing four and a half million dollar homes, and he is your bread and butter, like you're his bread and butter painter for that stuff, and that's what he finds value in for his clients. Why wouldn't you go after that? But because he, he's still he's that guy's deciding off a of price. Like I can't the number of times we we come in after someone's built that, and then we fix it. But like I think it starts at the top. Like you were just saying, the client that builds a twelve thousand dollars square foot house. Why don't we as as professionals say, you ever think about building a ten thousand square foot house and doing it a little nicer? Yeah. There, I think there should be more conversation based there. But you need to educate the architect at that point. 100%. Because I, I've been in that room where the client goes, hey, I want to build the exact same house I had, 4,200 square feet. You give it to an architect, he runs the numbers. I want my my baseline for him. Even though you may want the design, his baseline is 6,800 square feet. So guess what he draws Yeah. and puts that person in the corner and goes, all right, so I drew a 6,800 square foot house, but you're going to love it. And it's like, well... Who really has control here? And then in that process, how many people build multiple houses in a lifetime? They and don't. So to me, like, you, you get pushed into We're that just going to work for the people who actually get that 4,800 square foot house built and want it really nice. Because I used to try to go, well, how can I look at that 12,000 square foot house and how can I ever get them to be my client? I was like, I'm all set with that anymore. Like now I just want, who's building the 4,800 square foot house that wants it really nice? That like all I'm looking at is that group of people that are my perfect client, and I really am trying to ignore everybody else, because then I can really make people happy, and I can really carve out a niche, and to me that's going to be the most profitable in the long run. For that's my th that's my thesis. I, it may be proven wrong. I'm gonna. I hate to cut this short, but I really want Tyler back in on this conversation because I think, and I, I I do have to run. I'm not blaming it on him, but I think. This, I think talking about the paint industry was my initial thought on where this conversation would go. But now we're talking about not just paint, but how how we shift the mindset of our clients, architects, and everything else to, you know, like the square foot comparison. You know, rather than 12,000 square foot mediocre, what about if you do 10 and really high end and shifting that mindset? And I think Tyler would weigh in on that a lot. Or... F or what we always say, my dream is, or five or six rooms in the house, mm. really nice. Take the 2,000 off and make the entry hall, the kitchen, the yeah. dining room, make them really nice. And then, like, my always idea is, because I'm, I'm not I'm not Shoreline, have another painter that does. Yeah, we talked about it. I mean, we're doing that. Yeah, yeah. And and that's, to me, that's that would be amazing. But I think I've never met a painter yet that's like, you know what, that job's too high end for me. Let me call Zach. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of it is just. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, though, it's yeah, there's a competitiveness. Right. But I think this like the, the job that we're talking about that we're, we're doing, it's you guys have your strong suits and you guys are both going to execute where you're most you're 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 most valuable to yourselves and to us. Yeah. So. This was Zach, how do we find you? Uh, ZK painting on Instagram is probably the best spot. Um, like you guys, my website's going to be new this year <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, my big like new year's resolution is going to be to pay for professional photography on my job sites. Cause if you go to my page, the Wait, biggest did I send thing you Todd's? yeah, yeah, I did. Okay. I, my biggest number one lacking thing is like, I take, I document the whole process and then I'm on to the next one. And I, I have such a bad habit of not going back and getting those final photos. It's worth it. I'm I know. telling you. I, it's what I've picking up picked up from you guys so if that's my my big push next year is going to be to really start to put a lot more of the get the professional photography done that's awesome, awesome. Dude. you can find us at info at the modern craftsman.org i'm sorry you can email us there and you can find us on the modern craftsman.org website it is the holidays we're rolling into christmas next week jesus yeah. wow december started three days ago oh my god it's absolutely oh! Yeah. but no agreed um to next point you guys shape this podcast without your info and your feedback good or bad um save the bad to an email or dm to us yeah. um save the good to a five-star review damn right that's yeah. perfect yeah that's what we're saying so 
you know, we're not narcissistic here thinking that we do everything right. So we get it if we're trying to improve this podcast and hit us up, guys. We'll take the negative stuff and we'll drill down on it. We're trying to eliminate it. We are getting better. So I think. So yeah, and if, if you guys want to hear this conversation continue, shoot us a message or, or share this on uh, your story and let yeah. us know and we'll have Zach back on and we'll dig into this, uh, this high-end market across multiple industries, not just the painting. Yeah, all day. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for listening. Awesome. I appreciate it, Thanks guys. Thanks for the reviews. Take care.